Good to be with you for another Science Forum year. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Hans Christen, uh, a native of Zurich, Switzerland. He got his undergraduate degree, his master's degree, and his doctoral degree from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, where Einstein went to school. Uh, he came to the United States before his doctoral degree uh, to serve as a German language instructor at a college in Iowa, Center College, uh, and there met his wife, Chris. Uh, and so uh, they have been married for a while. She is a distinguished science writer in her own right at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, Dr. Kristen, after getting his doctoral degree, uh, did a two-year postdoctorate at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, then went with a private concern for three years, and then was grabbed back by Oak Ridge, and he's been there since uh, about uh, 2000, the year 2000, mm -hmm. uh, and he has been a research staff member a distinguished research staff member, a group leader, a program manager, and a director, uh, first of the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences, and just very recently, director now of the Neutron Scattering Division at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. He has published more than 180 uh, refereed journal articles, four book chapters, and he holds seven patents. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Hans Christen, <coughs> speaking on one atom at a time, the ultimate frontier of nanotechnology. <clears throat> Thank, Thank you very much. It's a nice introduction. Um, very glad to be here. Very excited to to talk about nanoscience. It's been a, a passion of mine for, for the last four and a half years that I have been the director of the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences. I just moved to Neutron Sciences this week, so this is a brand new move, but everything I will talk about here has to do with, with the work that we did at the Center for Nanophase Material Sciences. Um, a fascinating place. It's a, it's a research center and a user facility. That means people from around the world come and work with us. And, and, and we are responsible for developing techniques and approaches to help advance um, research in the field of nanoscience. Um, what I'm going to talk about is not strictly my work. I was in charge of coordinating and leading things, but the work is really done by others. And I particularly want to point out Steve and Jesse and Jason Folks who have done the majority of the work that I will talk about here. And I'll, I'll point to other people as I, as I go along. Um, so, I'm going to talk about one atom at a time and about nanotechnology uh, and why they fit together. Um, you know the old joke about atoms. You can't trust them because they make up everything. <laughs> um, so so um, how many atoms does it take to make up a human being? Well, it's six billion, 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 million of atoms to make up one person. And I'm almost certain that nobody in the room can imagine what that really means. It's just beyond our comprehension of what that really means. Um, and I want to explain a little bit of why it matters and, and, and how things fit together at, at the nanoscale. So nanotechnology, nanoscience, a word that a lot of people use, a lot of people hear. Um, what does the word nano mean? Well, it could be the iPod nano. It could be the Tata nano. But that's really not what I mean. It's also something that's been a lot of hype. Um, everything nano and nanobots and nano this and nano that. Um, even Elon Musk, founder of Tesla, says that if you have nano in your bio, that's, that's synonymous with BS. <laughs> um, so there's been a lot of hype about nano, but I want to point out that there are a lot of areas in nanoscience that are, that are not hype, that are very real. Um, and, and on a very personal level, what I'm talking about here is something when I started four and a half years ago at the Nanoscience Center, as research works, you make a proposal, you talk to your funding agencies, this is what we're going to do. And we said, we are going to take a material and put one atom exactly at the place where we want to put it. And everybody, including myself, were, were convinced this is a lofty goal 
It's almost impossible to reach this goal, but in science you have to have a big vision of where you want to go. You have to have the drive to do something that you think is important. And now, three years later, it is possible. So it's a fascinating journey that I, that I want to share some of, of it with you. So nano really means, means small. Um, and there's lots of jokes about nanoscience and about the Nanoscience Center where, where everybody focuses on the small ideas and it's really no big deal and, and all these things, right? Um, nano for a, from a mathematical perspective means 10 to the minus ninth. So that's a, a trillion times smaller than a meter. And that's the length scale at which you start to see individual atoms. So it's very small. Nanotechnology is the way of using or making small things. And, and nanotechnology is, is not new. Nanotechnology has been around for a very long time, used by people who did not know that they're using nanotechnology. The people who make stained glass windows did not know that the colors in stained glass come from gold and silver nanoparticles in the glass. The people in Damascus who made the steel did not know that by treating and hammering the steel, they would embed carbon nanoparticles into the steel that then results in the steel being strong. These are examples of nanotechnology that have been used without people knowing that they're using nanotechnology. But of course, it's much older than that. The lotus leaf sheds water because of nanoscale hair at the surface of the leaf. Seashells made of a fairly brittle material have mechanical strength because they're built by nanoscale bricks of very fragile material. The way they're put together, it, it shares the mechanical stress. A gecko can only walk on glass because he has nanoscale hair on, on the feet that interact with the glass. So these are, these are all areas of, of nanotechnology. And there's big questions of why, why do these things work? And that's what nanoscience is about. Understanding of how things are different when they're small and why they're different. That's really what we do, trying to figure out what happens when something is very small. The question is, how small is small? So this is a sample holder that goes into one of our advanced microscopes. The, it's about an inch diameter rod that, that fits into the microscope. And we can put a sample right here and zoom in till we see individual atoms. Now, as a comparison, imagine that you're holding the planet Earth in your hand, and it's the size of a golf ball, and you're looking at it, and you're zooming in, and you're zooming in till you see individual cars. That's the same magnification range. To be able to go in here then and say, here's a tungsten atom, and here's a molybdenum atom, which is what we can do, is the equivalent of saying, I'm looking at the planet Earth, and in that car there's a man and there's a woman. That's the scale of, of things we're looking at. Why does it matter? We have this slogan at the Nanoscience Center that little matters. It really does matter. It matters a lot. Um, and I want to give you two examples for why. And one of them is the, the question of surface area and how far something is away from a surface. And the other one is quantum pr properties. So let me talk first about surface areas. If you're a penguin and it's cold and you're in a flock of penguins, you don't want to be at the surface. The ones on the inside are warm, the ones on the outside are cold. So the number of penguins in that flock determine how many of you are cold and how many can stay on the inside. So in that case, a larger particle, a larger flock is better. Now if you're parking your car and you're parked in the middle of that, it's not so good if you have a, a large group. You want to be at the surface to be able to move your car, which is why we make parking lots in a certain shape. So this is kind of the same idea of you want to be at the outside. When you make a piece of material, how many of the particles are at the outside? That depends on how big the particle is. If you only have one atom, then obviously that one is at the outside. If you put four of them together, they're all at the outside. If you put 10 together, they're all at the outside. If you put 35 together, almost all of them are at the outside, and so on. Now stop drawing this after a while because it gets hard to draw these, but if you, grew, if you, if you draw a thousand of them, half of them would still be at the outside. If you, grow, if you put together 260,000 of them, only 10% are at the outside. At 200 million, 1% of them are on the outside. In one ounce of copper, 
0.00001% of all atoms are at the surface. So in a normal material, almost all of the atoms are on the inside, buried away somewhere, not seeing what's happening to the outside. In a nanoparticle, that is different. A large fraction of them are on the outside. And that fundamentally changes how a material interacts. If you take copper and carbon, two fairly boring materials, and you put them together by forming little carbon nanospikes, little fingers, they're a really tiny little hair of carbon, and you put copper nanoparticles on that, the interaction between those two materials allows you that if you apply an electric field, you can take a carbon dioxide molecule, break it down, take another carbon dioxide molecule and some water, and you form ethanol. It does take electricity, but you can take carbon dioxide and turn it into ethanol. This really matters. If you're a biorefinery, and you're taking sugar or cellulose, and you're making alcohol, a lot of the, the carbon from your material gets emitted as carbon dioxide. Just like you know, things ferment, bubbles come up, that's all carbon dioxide. That goes back into the atmosphere where it originally came from. Now if you're in the Midwest somewhere and you have a biorefinery, and the wind is blowing and you set up a windmill and you have some electricity, you take that electricity and you take that carbon dioxide and you turn it into, your, into ethanol for which you already have a distribution system because you're a refinery, that's a very valuable economic and, and environmentally relevant process. And so this, this discovery that if you put carbon particles a couple of particles and carbon nanospikes and make a catalyst out of it. This goes way beyond playing around. These are the kinds of things that can have a real impact. Yes? I'd like to ask questions. Sure. Okay. Is this what's happening with the carbon atmospheric carbon sequestration where they're, they're capturing the carbon out of the atmosphere and they're saying they're able to convert it to fuel? If you could do that efficiently, that would be great. Um, Separating carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere is actually not that simple because it's very dilute. So the best place to do it is, is at the place of, of origin, like a coal-fired carbon plant, a biorefinery, something like this, and, and then, then converting it, yes. The current approaches are high temperature approaches. They're not very efficient. This one works at room temperature. Once we get to a, par, a place of scaling it and making it larger, this could really change things. Yes? How many do we address you? Is Dr. Hansen or Hans? Or Just Hans. When you go down to those levels, is the picture that we're seeing taken with the time force microscopy? So, so this image here is taken with a transmission electron microscopy, and I'll show you in a moment okay. what that actually is. Sure. And that's just a side view of the same thing, and also in an elect electron microscope. Okay. So Thank you. I'll, I'll show about a bunch of things about electron microscopy. All right. So making things small changes what they do. It also allows things to move around. If your car is parked in the middle of that parking lot, you cannot take it out easily. You want your car to be at the edge here so you can drive in and out. In a battery where the storage of electricity relates to moving ions, lithium ions, in and out of the material, you don't want a big chunk of material. You want small particles of material so that ions can move in and out. And so the typical battery material looks like the picture on the right. Every cell phone has a battery that contains a material that's essentially carbon, uh, not carbon, uh, lithium phosphate type materials, nanoparticles. You cannot make a good battery without nanoparticles. So that brings me back to um, Elon Musk saying that nano is BS. The simple truth is that without nano, you cannot have an electric car. It just does not work. And he knows that. All right. The second thing I want to mention is quantum properties. And that's a little less intuitive because nothing in quantum mechanics is intuitive. Um, and, and, and if somebody says they truly understand it intuitively, they're probably lying because most physicists will admit that they understand the math, they understand the consequences, they understand to work with it, but fundamentally our brain does not understand this basic concept of wave-particle duality, which means that every particle at a very fundamental level is also a wave. We know this, we work with it, 
It's hard to understand, but that's what it is. Every particle of light is also a wave. Every electron can be described as a wave. That's how it is. And every wave has a wavelength. And whether you feel a wave or not depends on your size. If you're this cruise ship and there's some waves on the water, you probably don't notice those waves. But for this little guy, it does matter because his size is about the same of the wave. And so that little boat really strongly interacts with the waves. Now light is a wave, and we can make nanoparticles that are just about the size of the wavelength of light. When we do that, we can take a material like this beautiful, absolutely clear crystal of titanium dioxide, grind it up into very fine powder, it becomes very white, because it scatters light in all directions, and it's the basis of all white paints. So every white paint that we have is based on titanium oxide nanoparticles. Now there are some other nanoparticles that you can make to not just scatter light in, in all sort of the whole spectrum of visible light, but very specific wavelengths, and they have all sorts of very precise applications, some of them in nanomedicine for cancer treatment, some of them in diagnostics, some of them for sensors. So nanoparticles of very precise size and composition, they will respond to very specific wavelengths of light. They can be used in, in all sorts of, 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 of areas because of their quantum properties. So then the, the nanotechnology, making or using things is, is so broad. White paint is nanotechnology, your battery cell is nanotechnology, coatings and eyeglasses, nanocarbon in tires, catalytic converters in cars, everything in electronics. These are all examples of nanotechnology. A specific example from Oak Ridge National Lab is to be inspired from what, what plants do and some insects do of repelling water, creating an artificial coating that has the same properties it just got licensed to Samsung this year to make coatings on electronics. Imagine a coating on your um, touch screen on your phone that repels water and, and oil so that you can touch it as long as you want. It will never get dirty. Um, you can also spill your coffee over it. The coffee will just roll off of it. Um, obviously, lots of applications for, for coatings like this that you can just paint onto, onto surfaces. All right. So if light is a wave and we want to look at very small things, then if the thing is smaller than the wavelength of the light, we can no longer see it. And so with, a, with an optical microscope, you can only go down to a certain size, and then you have to do something else. And then we use electrons. And the scanning electron microscope is basically you take a focus beam of, of electrons, and you scan it across the surface, and you make an image from that. And so the, the image that I showed you of the nanoparticles for the battery, that's a scanning electron micrograph. We do this all the time. It gets more interesting when you realize that you can do things with that. When you have the electron beam coming and hitting on the surface, there's, there's a charge there. And if you put a big molecule in the area, and this is this big organic molecule that contains a platinum, a bunch of methyl groups, it's kind of an unstable thing. An electron comes in, this molecule breaks apart. Most of the carbon and oxygen and, and hydrogen evaporate out. The platinum stays behind. Now we can use this to go in and shine the electron beam at a surface and flood this um, gas at it and, and, and write with it. And this is not an entirely new technique. So about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people started doing this. It's called electron beam induced deposition. Initially, it really didn't work well. It depends on which side the electrons come in, which side the gas flow comes in. Everything is very distorted. And so um, Jason Folks and co-authors at the CNMS started to do very careful calibrations and using some computer simulations to understand how exactly this process works and how you can use this to build up things. This is really 3D printing at the nanoscale um, and you can make these structures. These are beautiful structures with very precise shapes. They're small. It takes about 80 of them put side by side to end up with the width of a human hair. Human hair. So they're really, really tiny particles. They're beautiful. Um, you can imagine all sorts of things you could do with them. The biologists get very excited because you can grow one single cell into this and tether it to a surface and have a, a cage for just one cell, for example. Um, it's fascinating. It's beautiful. 
but they're not very good materials. So the next step is, can we make these into good, good metals, good electrical conductors? And for that, you need to play additional tricks. You introduce some other gases. You hit it with a laser to burn off some more of the carbon. And you can end up with some good metallic structures. One, one application is in plasmonic devices. So a, a plasma, plasmon is a, is a very interesting phenomenon. If you have an electrically conducting surface, there's electrons in there. These electrons can move around. And they can couple to light. And they collectively move like a little wave of, of electrons. So there's a strong interaction between the electrons at the surface of a material and the light. Um, and and um, this is actually something that is, that is happening a lot. And, and the reason that you can make stained glass windows is that if you take a metal particle and you put it in light, and light has a certain wavelength, the electrons move around with that light. And if the particle is just of the right size, that the electrons move around, that are happy moving around like a swing that just happens to have the right length, that it that oscillates in the right time, you get a resonance. The electrons move around and scatter light back off at a specific, very specific color. And so if you make gold nanoparticles of a certain size, it will scatter light at a very precise color. That's why there's red stained glass and blue stained glass. And, and it just depends on the size of the nanoparticle in the material. Now, there's a lot more you can do with, with, um, with plasmonic devices. You can make, make sensors. You make interconnects. You can make optical transmission. A lot of things that scientists would like to do with plasmons. But you need to put your little nanostructures with a precise shape at the precise location and with high purity so that you have the right electrical properties. And, and so the chemical synthesis route that I just mentioned doesn't work so well because you really can't put them. You can make a whole you know, stained glass full of nanoparticles, but you cannot go and tell that nanoparticle to go there. That's really hard to do. You can use what we call electron beam lithography, a technique that's used in semiconductor devices and so on. You can make beautiful high purity structures. You can put stuff exactly where you want it as long as it's flat. And that's very limiting. It has to be flat. Yes? Does it have any application with graphene? Um, so there are, there are some, some plasmon modes in graphene. Um, I don't think it's really, an, it's, it's studied a lot, but it hasn't really found any true applications. As, as opposed to metallic plasmon structures. But the metallic plasmon structures we can 3D print, and this is what they look like. This is collaboration between CNMS and, and people from Austria that come here to work with us on this. You can build these structures, these, these, these funny looking little antennas. The color maps here basically indicate when you ex excite them at a certain energy, they resonate in different ways, different ways and there's different modes in which they re-emit light. Um, first proof of concept that you can actually 3D print at the nanoscale um, plasmonic structures. Yes. Hans, as you grow these, um, mm -hmm. how do you over overcome the problem of the, the substrate itself that might have iron and other chemicals, mm -hmm. which is going to take away from the purity of mm -hmm. carbon nanotubes or boring nanotubes? How do you overcome that? So they're typically grown on high purity silicon wafers, the same, the same kind of wafers that are used for, for in semiconductor industry. So they're some of the purest materials we can get. So we start with a very clean surface to, to start building those Any things on. Any ideas about yeah. taking like, the top layer, if I wanted to use something in electronics, I kind of realized that there's contamination at that lower level there in the substrate, mm -hmm. taking those top layers for the purity? Could. Typically, it's actually those. The, the starting material is so good that that's not, that's not a, a real concern in, in, for these kinds of applications. Um, so the, the, they're, they're somewhat robust to, to impurities. They're not at the, I mean, semiconductor, you have extremely low level of impurities. Um, here we have thousands of times more impurities already, and it doesn't matter for the electrical what conduction. What I'm thinking about is that you're pushing around electrons. So mm -hmm. you have carbon and boron and nanotubes. Mm -hmm. They're down to the electron level. So I'm pushing them mm -hmm. electrons. Mm -hmm. And the purity of the material mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. important. Typically, the, the, the impurities of the best nanotubes you can grow, they're much less pure than the silicon crystal that you put them on. Yeah. 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 Okay, All right, so, so these are examples of, of 3D printing at the nanoscale. The one on the left I showed you before. The one on the right is a 3D printed gas sensor. We can now go in onto a semiconductor device and say, I really need a gas sensor here. And, and integrate things into, into devices. 
um, incredible opportunities when you could start 3D printing things at these length scales. And we can also do it at larger length scales. And we got a lot of publicity out of this for a funny reason. So we said, what about if you made a, a, a fidget spinner using a specific process that we call two-photon lithography? That's a bit larger, but this, th these two pictures are the same scale. So this is our fidget spinner, and this is a human hair. I just put in the, the, the picture of a clean room. The reason we do this work in a clean room is that if you're working on this device and you're leaning over it and your hair falls down onto the sample, that hair will knock out your device. Right? So, so, so you have to keep things clean. But then you can make these fidget spinners. Um, you can't go in there with your finger and spin them because your finger is a little bit bigger, um, a whole lot bigger. Um, but you can blow air on them and, and they will spin. Um, this is a re remarkably difficult thing to do. Um, because when you 3D print something that can rotate, at one point you have to start printing something that's not attached to anything else. You can print an axle, but to, to print the hub, you somehow have to start printing this without it being attached to anything. You have to start printing into thin air. So it's not a trivial thing to do. It's a major breakthrough, and it's really exciting for people who build fluidic devices. You've all heard of these little devices to go into the field and do medical diagnosis out in the field or chemical weapons detection. Those are all fluidic devices. We can make channels f where fluids go through. But if you want to make mixers and pumps and things like this, you need something that rotates. And we can now do it. Yes? What's the cost of your fidgets? The cost of them? I really don't know. I, I really don't know, but, but, but we can put hundreds of them on one wafer. I mean, they're, they're, yeah. They cost less than the finger it would take to spin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Now, one of, the, one of the exciting things is, so I just talked about this nanoscale 3D printing with the electron beam and the slightly larger scale printing here with, with light. You can put these two things together. You can, you can bring, build build a scaffold using the, the, this technique, the optical technique, and then at the top, print something smaller using the electron beam technique. And it turns out that's extremely important because when you make things at the nanoscale, well, that's all good and fine, but how are you going to interact with it? How are you going to probe it? How are you going to make connections to it? Somehow you have to have a way to go from your big fat wire to your tiny little thing. And so you have to have a method to do this, and if you're combining these techniques, you can get there. Now, sometimes we want to go smaller. And for the smallest things, we don't use a scanning electron microscope. We use a scanning transmission electron microscope. So we take a very thin sample, and you focus us. We're, we're focusing our electron beam, and we can focus the electron beam down to the fraction of the size that corresponds to the spacing between two atoms. And we shine it through the sample. And if you take a very thin sample, like a, 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 a single layer of a material, then we end up with these beautiful images that I showed before. So there are lots of materials that we can prepare that are single sheets of, of atoms. So graphene is one of them. It's just a single sheet of carbon atoms that look arranged like a chicken wire, one atom thick, nice material. Those materials exist. This is, this is tungsten disulfide. Um, there's lots of different materials that you can make in, in a, in a two-dimensional form. Um, and so we shine the electron beam through it, and we get this perfect image where we can see every single atom in the material. Now, that doesn't always happen, because a lot of times we want to look at something like a semiconductor device, a block of material. It's not a single atom thick, but we still want to, do, want to know what it is. So what we do then is we cut out a little slice, and we put that slice into the microscope. And now we're looking at a projection. We're shining the electron beam through it, and we see a, what we call a cross-section image. And, and so every dot here now does not correspond to one atom. It corresponds to a row of atoms in your sample. And we do that a lot. Um, and, and, and that gives us information about how sharp an interface between two materials is. So this is a stack of, of different oxide materials that we looked at how sharp the interfaces are. Very good characterization technique. So people have been doing this for 10, 15 years. Um, and there is one area up here that you can see, well, the image kind of goes away. And it goes away because up there it's amorphous. And when you make it, it became amorphous. So, so a quick detour. What does amorphous mean? In a crystalline material, all the atoms are nicely arranged. In an amorphous material, they're, they're kind of randomly thrown in there. Does it matter? Of course it matters. These are examples of crystals. If I take the exact same chemical composition and make it amorphous, I end up with something very different. Um, so you can take diamond, a beautiful crystalline material, 
or glassy carbon, a, a hard black material. It's the exact same chemical composition. In one case, it's crystalline. In the other case, it's, it's randomly arranged atoms. So, so whether the material here is crystalline or amorphous does matter. And one of the microscopists at Oak Ridge National Lab tried to really look at the interface between the amorphous and the crystalline material. And this is a classic example of good science. So she was looking at that, and she realized that her interface is drifting away. Wait a second, it's not drifting away. It's crystallizing. So, so by going in there and looking at it at the edge, she realized that the, she starts to crystallize material within the amorphous material. So now you can use the electron beam to locally change from an amorphous material to a crystalline material, and you can actually grow these little fingers of material into the material. So the electron beam here can be used to change what, what the, 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 the phase of the material is. You can go a step further and look at dopants. So we talked about the purine and semiconductors. Um, semiconductors like silicon are extremely pure crystals and they're really boring materials. You cannot do anything with them until you dope them. And you put a very, very small amount of dopants in there and that changes the electronic properties. And that makes it from going, being an insulator into being a conductor. Knowing where the dopants are and what to do is very important. And Andy Lupini and his postdoc have been looking at using the electron beam to push a dopant around. You take one little atom, and so in this, in this sequence of images, so here, here was a, a, a bismuth in the silicon material, and then this is the sequence of images that I'm sure you cannot see, but, but basically you put the electron beam in front of it, and you excite the material there, and eventually the bismuth will move over there, and the silicon will move over there, and you can make it move over here, and you can make it move around. So you can push one atom around. Now, moving atoms around has been done before. So in the early 90s, Don Eigler at IBM, they used what is called a scanning tunnel microscope. It's essentially a very, very sharp needle, sharp enough that you can pick up one atom with it and go and place it somewhere else. And they've used that to, to, to create these beautiful structures. They're absolutely fascinating. They really allow you to see the quantum effects in materials as long as you keep it at extremely cold temperatures because as soon as you warm it up, those atoms will start moving around. And you keep it in an extremely high vacuum because as soon as a hydrogen molecule or carbon molecule or water molecule comes by and, and knocks at the surface, the whole structure will be gone. So they're extremely unstable, whereas the ones here in this crystal are actually embedded in a crystal structure. And, and, and so then you can start thinking of actually using them for something. Now there's a big downside, and, and, and that's, that has to do with, with how we're doing this in the electron microscope. We're actually no, not looking at individual atoms. We're looking at columns. So think of this crystal and I'm looking through it. I know somewhere in here there is a bismuth and I'm going to move this bismuth over here, over here, over here. But I don't really know where it's going in the depth. I know where it's going laterally but not where it's going in the depth. So that's the downside of that. But there are materials where there's only one layer. So if instead of doing it in silicon I do it in one of these two dimensional materials, then I have a chance of taking one atom and knowing exactly where it is. So we take a sheet of carbon, which is graphene, and we come in with our electron beam. And this is the actual image. This is, this is the graphene lattice. And we come in somewhere here with the electron beam. And we sit there for a little while and we create a hole. And you can actually see that you created a hole. Then we put some silicon atoms on the surface. Actually, in reality, they just happen to be there. It's this dirt that happens to be on the, on the surface. And we take the electron beam and we shine the electron beam at those silicon atoms and kind of raster it around. That knocks some of those silicon atoms away and they fly across the surface and eventually one of them will land in the hole exactly where it was. So now you went in, you drilled a hole and you put a silicon in exactly in the place where you wanted it to be. This is what four years ago people would have told us, you can never do that. This is really uh -huh. the chemistry. I mean it's, it's trying to become stable because of the the formation of the way the carbon atoms are in silicon, it, it finds it. Exactly, exactly. It, it, it finds the hole that we made. So, so we make the hole yeah. where we want the hole, and then the, and then the chemistry takes, takes care of the rest. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. Now, we can, we can place those there, and we can move them. Once they're there, this video shows one of those silicon atoms being moved around, just like they were moved around in the other crystal. We can also do this in 
this two-dimensional sheet. Yes? What happened to all the other silicon? So um, all these chunks of material here, if it, the, the, the silicon, they run away, and they will find another chunk of silicon, and they'll stick to that. They'll, they'll go, they'll find something where, that they can stick to. Imagine a, um, a, uh, a, uh, a pool table with pockets, and, and, and you just throw the, the, the balls across. Eventually, they all go down in somewhere. Um, that, that's what happens. They move around very fast. When, while they're moving, we cannot see them. They move way too fast. So, so there's a lot of, a lot of indirect things. This, this, is, this is an interesting part because there are a lot of things we can see, and there are a lot of things we cannot see. We cannot see them move. Um, and so we have to resort to other ways of understanding what's going on. And, and for that, we use uh, computational simulations, computer simulations, to, to model what actually happens. How does a silicon atom move when it moves around the surface? Does it actually move fast? Yes, it moves fast. Does it move too fast for us to see it? Yes, it moves too fast for us to see it. Will it stick to a hole? Yes, it will fall into a hole. So all of these things we observe, but there's a gap, certain things that we cannot see that happen at a very fast time scale. And for those areas, we need computational um, modeling to, to get there. So the main motivation for this, let me go one step further. We can then arrange those. We can make little structures. We can make a little silicon dimer. We can make a little silicon trimer, a little tetramer. We can go in there and now move them around till they're exactly where they are. The motivation for doing so originally came from, well, originally came from, wow, can we do this, right? <laughs> Um, um, but but th there is something extremely important here, and that is that the whole field of quantum computing. All of our computers are based on, on, a, on a platform of computers that's decades old, that's computing based on ones and zeros. And if you have something that's continuous, you have to make an approximation. Right? You cannot do one third. You can do 0 0.33 or 0 0.333 if you have enough of the little bits and so on. But it can never be exactly at one third because you only work with zeros, zeros and ones. And so if you're, if you're simulating and modeling how things move around, you always have to do sort of discrete steps. You can never do something that corresponds to nature. Computing is, 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 is fundamentally chopped into little blocks in, in numbers and in time steps. So that's an enormous limitation. We built these enormously big computers to have smaller time scales and smaller length scales to simulate things at. But we're using a technology that's fundamentally limiting. Quantum computing is the idea that you use the, the way of how wave functions of electrons interact to get a continuous process. Um, so it, it, it's really a using of quantum mechanics to do information processing. Um, it's an in, in extremely important um, approach. Um, computing is a very energy intense process. Um, so at Oak Ridge National Lab, we operate a big neutron facility. It's a large, huge building, lots of beam lines, 400 people working there, and we're operating a big supercomputer. That supercomputer uses a multiple of times the electricity of the entire neutron facility. The cooling water going to the computer comes in into thir in 36 inch pipes. So, so computing takes an enormous amount of energy. Um, finding different ways of computing is, is, is extremely important if you want to go forward um, because it just becomes prohibitive to, to keep scaling. It's also an important security aspect. Um, there are algorithms that are being tested that will break all the encryption that we have. All of the encryption that we're using in, in phones, in banking, in military, in, in, in anything is based on the fact that certain mathematical problems are almost impossible to solve with standard computing. Quantum computing will change that, and whoever gets there first will be able to crack anybody's code. So this is an incredibly aggressive international race of who gets to quantum computing first. And to make quantum computing work, you have to be able to put quantum entities in a certain arrangement so that they can interact with each other in a certain way. And being able to place atoms exactly where you want to place them is the starting point. I, I guess a question and a point. Um, 
computers are binary, base mm -hmm. two. Quantum computers are base. No base. It's continuous um, rotation of a spin that can be take any value. There's no base. I mean, it, the, the fundamental concept it doesn't need to be a base because it's a continuous state. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. One last question mm -hmm. is, okay, so right, you've got a quantum input, quantum mm -hmm. computer. Mm -hmm. Don't you still have, like you mentioned earlier, Hans? Don't you still have to have those interfaces? To yes. Process? Yes. Absolutely. And that's um, that's the the funny thing about quantum computing. You 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 put in the initial state, you let it compute, and then you read it out. And it's 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 discrete at the beginning and discrete at the end, yeah. and in between it's a quantum process. Okay, yep, yep. Anyway, so here we are. We are now at the point where we can place atoms exactly where we want them to be. So to compare this to the length scale, we do this on a microscope. We have this little sample holder, and on there, we're moving these atoms around. This is the equivalent of looking at your planet Earth, taking a little probe and nudging so that the person who sits in the front of the car moves to the back of the car. That's the equivalent of the length scale. So, yes? Uh, does this have medical application? Because I mean, I can see like cell repair. Yep, yep, yep. Right now it's all one at a time. I understand. Right? But so, I, I so. See where, where it would. Yeah. Yep, but yep. At mm -hmm. this point, you're at below 100 nanometers, 50 nanometers. Mm -hmm. You're at the DNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, these, these, are, these are individual atoms, so yeah. there is nothing that is too small for this. There is no, this is really, this is why I, I call this title the ultimate frontier. There is no material that relies on something that's smaller than what this is. This is really, this is it. We are now at the point where we can move atoms exactly where we want them to be. And really, this is, this is, this is the end of my talk. I, I, I think I managed to convince you that nano really is not new. But there are a lot of new things in nano. Thank you very much. <laughs> we'll start up here for now. Sure. Yeah. Mass but no base. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that? Um, yes. Um, math is a description of nature that uses a way of describing it and it imposes a quantization on it that we give it numbers 0 to 10 uh -huh. but in reality if you're looking at which direction is something pointing it's not 0 to 10 it can any be anything but the moment you want to describe it you need to put it in a base so we you and I can talk about it but before you and I talk about it it doesn't need a base right in essence Nature is basis. In truth. That's pretty interesting. When I look at the technology, you have a machine like the, the brain name is Cypher, it's an atomic force microscope. Mm -hmm. You can get materials such as carbon nanotube, put the mica on it, mm -hmm. basically go down the optical, and then I, I call it, you know, ATM fishing. Here looking mm -hmm. for a place mm -hmm. where it can take off. Mm -hmm. With a wet well, I can look at DNA or, or amino acids. Mm -hmm. because, of, because of folks at Cypher were smart enough to say, well, I can do a dry sample, mm -hmm. I can do a wet sample. Mm -hmm. Is the technology, forgive me, I don't know, the mm -hmm. technology that you mentioned earlier, could I also do that with amino acids and DNA? So, in other words, mm -hmm. it's a wet sample. OK, OK. So, so for, for everybody else's benefit, there, there are really two ways of looking at things at the atomic scale. And I've only talked about one of the two, and that's using an electron beam. The other one is using a very sharp probe. And that's the, the scanning tunnel microscope approach, or atomic force microscope, or whatever scanning probe approach it is. So there you're looking at something at a surface, and you're looking at it with a very small needle, and that needle is sharp enough to, to, to have a, a, a sharpness that corresponds to a single atom. And, and, and that's, that's actually been done quite routinely, and that's how Don Eigler did those nice, beautiful quantum structures. You can do things at a surface with that. Then it's been expanded to do things in a liquid, because you can stick your probe. You can essentially have the whole microscope in a liquid, um, and you can move things around in a liquid, and you can play with that with a scanning probe. 
the electrons won't let you do that very well because electrons don't go through liquids very well. Now there are what you call liquid cells for these electron microscopes and um, I don't have a picture of it here but it's basically an extremely thin boron nitride membrane, a liquid, another extremely thin boron nitride membrane and in between that you have your sample and you're shining your electron beam through it and because the way your electron beam focuses down and, and out again you put your focus right in the middle and, and the windows and the liquid only give you a little bit of background. So you can do some of this in a liquid but it's much harder and you have much more broadening and scattering of electrons. It makes everything more difficult. Yeah. But, but Andrew, if, if I can ask another question, I'll be quiet. Mm -hmm. But doesn't that open up the opportunity to having a biological computer? In other words, I can use DNA or RNA in terms of a state mm -hmm. change mm -hmm. for a semiconductor? Or am I just way out left field? No, no. There, there, are, there are ideas of of, um, of, of tethering DNA specifically to, to, um, to, to semiconductor devices. More often not for computing but for sensing. Um, DNA is, is wonderful with how it selects certain things yes. and so you can, you can let it respond to a certain, you know, that's how you can do some, some genetic analysis, you can do some, some detection, you have a molecule that binds only to something or responds only to something, you take that specific molecule, you put it specifically on a transistor, that transistor will know whether or not that molecule has bonded to another molecule, those things happen a lot. Not, yeah. I don't know if it's true, but what I was thinking is rather than a shock and approach mm -hmm. to cures for cancer, mm -hmm. couldn't you actually at that nano level have that design, you know, this nano vial semiconductor actually hunt for and position itself next to those, those cancer cells? So it yep. would be a uh -huh. directed? Yeah, it's, it, um, it's, it, you're, you're, you're working a little bit against statistics. I mean, the very first slide of how many atoms there are in a human being, you have to search a long ways before you find the one molecule that you need. So, so it's not that trivial, but with, with, with a lot of the, um, the, 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 the use of, of nanoparticles in cancer treatment. So I showed the, the nanoparticles that, that, that emit light at a very specific wavelength. You can, f you can take a nanoparticle and bind an enzyme to it that only tethers to a certain kind of byproduct of cancer growth. And you can put this in your body and you have it all over, it floats around and whenever it hits a cancer cell it gets stuck. Then you can excite it, it will re-emit light and this light will kill, kill the cancer tumor. So those are the kinds of things that you do. That's really good yeah. chemistry. I mean the technology, yeah. you, need yeah. the bond you need to, you need, to, yes, for those things you don't want to go and place it in a, in a certain location. You want chemistry to do it for you. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Job, yeah. Yes. Are there tours of the facility that are allowed? I know some, so, some, some uh -huh. are available here. I didn't know. Right. So, so um, unfortunately, not as often as I would like. I mean, there there are opportunities. There are groups that come out that that uh, contact the the Ornell protocol office and say, here's this group of people who wants to come out, and and sometimes that that is university groups and sometimes it's a church group. So, it's, so there's the whole spectrum of people who come out and visit the facility. Um, we had a, what we call the lab day, a sort of an open house um, in June, I think it was, right? This summer or April. It's so, been eight or nine years since. So there was one this year. Yes, but, it's but before that, it's been a very long time, yes. yes. And, and I think the plan is to do it more often um, to, to allow people to come and visit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? It, it, it sounds like the, the implications Okay. So, okay. So, so I am not familiar with what the ultimate limits and frontiers are of of nanomedicine. That's not my field. I don't understand medicine. I don't understand the topics. I don't understand the opportunities. So, I, I really can't comment on that. I work at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's a Department of Energy facility. Our main focus is things related to energy. And that's either finding different ways to compute, which we're doing here, or finding different ways to convert energy or batteries to store energy, those things that 
understanding what the mechanisms are at the nanoscale and how we can use those is really where I see the, the big impact. If we can change how we harvest carbon dioxide and use it, if we can change how we store energy from, from, from renewable power sources by having batteries that are more reliable and cheaper and, 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 and more efficient, we can have a real impact on, on what happens on this planet. And that, that's, what, that's, that's the area that we're focusing on. Yes? How about gecko pads? Because I have my study. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I haven't made any of those. Uh, <laughs> well, you want to climb up glass, I <laughs> yeah. Yes. I was curious about the, uh, mm -hmm. the beautiful stained glass window mm -hmm. you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned that each, I think you said, atom, uh, when it's activated, gives off light mm -hmm. of a certain mm -hmm. wavelength. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, it's in the visible spectrum. Mm -hmm. Is that, uh, I think the word is coherent. If you have two atoms next to each other, will the light coming off be coherent? In other words, will the wavelength or the energy okay. be okay. in the same? On the same phase? Organized, okay. Yes. And of course, I've uh -huh. used polarized anyway. Right, right. And then just on mm -hmm. the same part of the question, mm -hmm. you know, with the films in particular, the receptor, if I can use that word, uh, pigment, often didn't have, uh, wasn't activated by that. That So, for example, in the old mm -hmm. photogram, if you took a, a mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. tree, for example, mm -hmm. you couldn't record the pigment because it didn't have the. That that wavelength. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. what's the story up here? Uh, mm -hmm. Also, would it be possible that the light coming up there, which has does have a color, but which the human eyes are able to see in that? Okay. So so multiple questions here. So so the first thing these are these are gold and also silver particles, not individual atoms, but actually particles that are in the range of 100 nanometers to 300 nanometers size. Um, if, and if this is in, in, in window glass and light comes in that has a wavelength, okay, so, so, so on this particle, the electrons can move around and, and they can move from one side to the other and like a pendulum on a clock, if, you, if they, they would prefer to oscillate at a certain frequency. And if the light that comes in is just at that frequency, it will resonate and, and, and it will re-emit light in, in, in all directions of that wavelength. If a different light comes in, it will get absorbed, and it just kind of it will get absorbed. Okay. It will just kind of die, mm -hmm. um, and so so if you have red stained glass, and the yellow light comes in, it just it's just dark. If if red light comes in, it it, 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 it shines brightly, right? So so it actually doesn't. It's a resonant phenomena, but it's not a coherent phenomena. So the wavelengths, the waves front, the wave fronts are not coherent. They're out of phase, but it's a resonant process. So it's 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 specific um, um, thing. Um, so that was for that question, and I apologize, I don't remember well, what the... Had those two, I thought you said atoms together, mm -hmm. and they're activated. The mm -hmm. light coming off, is, mm -hmm. it, uh, is it coherent? It's, it's, it's not coherent, no, not it's coherent. not coherent, no, no, no. But it's polarized? Um, it, it can be on some of the nanoparticles, so that you can actually use like oblong nanoparticles that makes a polarizer, mm -hmm. um, because then they, it can only... You know, it, 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 in this polarization, it, it can only go for blue light. In this polarization, it can only go for red light and things like that. So, so that, that gives some of those funny things that, depending on how you turn them, they look different. Is there any application mm -hmm. for that in optical development? Because I think a lot of the uh, definitions use the plot. Mm -hmm. You think of the ones we had back in the basic physics, mm -hmm. when, you know, really in the initial one, it was talking about the refractory, was talking about monochromatic light. But right, never right. Said that. Okay, no, okay, no, yeah, yeah, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, and there's a lot of, I mean, there's, 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 there's this whole area of, of, of phosphorus, of, of materials that, that take energy, typically from electrons or from some kind of light, and turn it into different light. Um, so that that's allows us to have fluorescent tubes that emit light that looks white to us and not blue, um, that allows us to make these uh, projectors and, and TV screens and, and all that. So you, you take energy and, and remit it in a specific wavelength. Mm -hmm. Yes? One last question. <laughs> the emergence of uh, carbon nanotubes and boron nanotubes mm -hmm. in the electronics industry and semiconductors. Mm -hmm. what I'm, I don't know if it's true or not. What I'm mm -hmm. hearing is that we're seeing the end of silicon-based semiconductors. 
the next generation that gets away from the heat and size issue mm -hmm. is going to take us down into the nanotube level, which would be the carbon of the more nanotube. Are, are you hearing things like that? In other words, the physicons yep. for mm -hmm. silicon-based mm -hmm. semiconductors, it, we have, we've exhausted the physics. We've yeah, so. smaller, there's heat issues. Yep. Now we've opened up the door. Right, right. So there's, there's two things that happen with semiconductor technology when you, when you make it smaller. The reason to make things smaller is so that you can put more transistors or switches close together so that you can treat more information faster. If you have individual things far apart, it takes a lot of time to, to, to move information around. So you want to have, have everything close together so it can be done very fast. Um, there's two, two problems that happen. One of them is there has to be, to, for these transistors to work, there has to be an insulating layer. And, and a material can be insulating, but if the thickness becomes smaller than the typical wavelength of the electron, nothing is insulating anymore. So there's a fundamental limit of how thin you can make an insulator and that material still being an insulator. That's one of the problems on the insulator side. But even on the conductor side, mention that silicon is a boring material until you start doping it to give it electronic properties. We're now at the point in your, in your, in your current processors where a gate or a, a channel in a transistor contains just about a dozen of dopant atoms. You can go a little bit smaller, but then you better make sure that you have one of them in there. And then you get to the point where, you know, if you, if you have a thousand, it doesn't matter if you have a thousand or a thousand and one. If you have 12, it matters a kind of whether you have 12 or 13. But if you have one, it changes everything whether you have one or not. And at that point, you can no longer go smaller because you can no longer dope the semiconductor. So, so that has stopped, and semiconductor devices are no longer getting smaller. That, that thing is over. What people are doing now is to have multiple processors in parallel so that you share the responsibilities. Um, and, and you can, a lot of work has been happening to put those together more closely and, and, and integrate them better and rewriting the algorithms so that you can divide the task between different, different processors. And that's where all the development in the last five or so years has been on, on computing, you can no longer go smaller on the, on the fundamental level of the semiconductor device. And so there's been this talk about going to other materials and, and, and that talk has been around for, for about 15 years that we're going to be at the end of silicon and we have to do something about it. Um, and it turns out that making a transistor out of something other than silicon is extremely expensive making 20 silicon uh, chips is a lot cheaper than going to a new material. And that's where, that's where it's been going. And that's where computers are big and take a lot of power. Um, but, uh, but it's just silicon processing is so efficient and has so far developed that any introduction of a new material, of a new approach, is, is a nightmare for the industry. And, and it's just a whole lot cheaper to, to, to make more of it rather than to make them smaller. Haven't you seen that with every industry as expensive and then as the commercial appeal, you see those prices being reduced on a particular anything? Yeah, I, I, yeah, right, at one point. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, but there's some things that you can't scale, right? You, I mean, you can, you can make a very bad battery out of bad material. And at one point, you can just say, well, it's going to get cheaper, so I'm just going to buy 100 bad batteries instead of making one better one. That doesn't work very well for your cell phone. Right. So, so if you want to keep things small, you eventually you have to go for something better. Yeah, the result, thank you, Dr. Christian, very, very much. Thank you. All right.